So Robert, you've written this wonderful, thought-provoking book about E.J. Hughes' work on Shawnigan Lake. Thank you for doing so. Um, it's really something that's added to the art historical record and to people who are interested in that part of the world, as I am very much. As a starting point, I wonder, would you mind speaking a bit about how you first met E.J. Hughes and how you came to know him and his work so well? I'd be happy to do so. I hope this uh, microphone distance is uh, reading loud and clear in the audience. Um, I uh, came to Victoria in 1975, and uh, one day I was in the uh, Special Collections Library at the University of Victoria and discovered a beautiful painting. It's a painting of logs in the water at Ladysmith Harbor uh, by an artist named D.J. Hughes. Uh, having grown up in Toronto when the world was full of abstract paintings, I, I, I had never heard of Hughes. And uh, I soon learned that Hughes had a reputation of being a rather reclusive person who lived somewhere in the wilderness of Vancouver Island. But he was a realist painter in the modern age, and that really appealed to me. And uh, the more I discovered about Hughes' paintings, the more I felt, for instance, there was an exhibition of his uh, up in Nanaimo at the university there, and I went to see the exhibition, and when I came out of the gallery, suddenly the whole world looked like a Hughes painting. <laughs> you know, when an artist can do that to you, really change the way you see things, uh, I think they're uh, really having a very positive effect. So I persisted and uh, saw every Hughes exhibition there was. Uh, they were few and far between. There were very few of his paintings on Vancouver Island. You don't, you didn't see them in people's homes. But um, uh, I wrote about him in my newspaper column in uh, very favorable terms. And one day in 1993, a woman named Pat Salmon telephoned me and she said, Mr. Hughes would like to know if you'd like to join him for lunch. If you and your wife would care to join us, we're coming into town. His, it's his annual trip to Victoria to get his car serviced. <laughs> <laughs> I w was expecting a sort of hermit or something, I don't know what, but we went to the snug at the Oak Bay Beach Hotel and uh, uh, Hughes came in and he was sort of gregarious and jovial and bright blue eyes, erect, bearing, very upright, and neatly trimmed mustache. He was wearing this necktie at the time. This is Hugh's own necktie. Oh, wow, the very same one. <laughs> so Pat Salmon emptied out a paper bag full of photographs on the table, and we proceeded to start looking at the photographs of his paintings and talking about them. Well, talk about them. We were there for two hours before we got around to ordering lunch. <laughs> he wasn't a hermit at all. He just didn't, he liked social circumstances which were under his, which were, you know, what he, what he had decided he wanted to do. So anyway, we had a lovely time. And uh, three years later, I was called again and uh, asked if my wife and I would like to join them for lunch at Maple Bay. So we met them in the parking lot of the White Spot restaurant in Duncan, and we all got into his Jaguar, uh, Hughes and I sitting in the back seat. And uh, he took us to his home and uh, invited me to come and visit his studio, uh, which I photographed at the time. And then we went out to Maple Bay. And after lunch, we drove around the waterfront there, and he'd, he'd be indicating to, my wife, who was driving his car, um, <laughs> she, she, you know, just pull over to the side here by that tree. Now, slowly, okay, stop here. Because the view out the window was, of course, exactly the view he was painting at home at that time. Oh, wow. I mean, I, I couldn't believe the, the experience of the artist I so richly admired, who was taking me right into his world to see things through his eyes. Those really are the two major time, two major events I had. It, I met him a few times uh, other than that, but those were uh, the big ones.
Oh, well, thank you for sharing that. That, that, that opens up a lot. Um, I'm curious as well, I know you've written multiple books on E.J. Hughes, including one on his work as a war artist. Um, would you mind uh, sort of letting us know sort of a summary of the books that you've written? And I see, I see a stack of them here and letting us know more specifically about what made you want to delve into doing one at Shawnigan Lake. I know it makes a lot of sense for his career, but maybe just to explain that to everyone here. I sure will, just a moment. Take the microphone just a little bit further away. Oh, sure. Um, the, I began in 2010. Pat Salmon, who I, I mentioned had been with us in both of those luncheon events, was Hugh's great helper. And uh, Pat had been working since 1977 to write the biography of E.J. Hughes. But there was more and more information, and he kept getting more and more famous. And the, the whole thing really got, got, up, got out of her hands. She continued to interview him constantly and photograph his work and collect everything about him. And she became his social secretary and his gopher and his helper of all sorts of things. But after Hughes died in 2007, uh, Pat, Pat was, uh, her health was in decline. She had Parkinson's disease and she realized she would never be able to really bring this project together. So she called me one day on the phone and she said, I would like you to become Hughes' biographer. Well, I didn't hesitate. I said yes right away. And I began making visits and she gave me the archive which she had collected on him. And I began sorting it out and putting it all into order and trying to come to terms with the huge amount of information she had s squirreled away. And uh, I knew it was going to result in some sort of book, but it took a while to figure out what what kind of book. Mm -hmm. And uh, a few years later, after I had made the acquaintance of the ladies who are in charge of the Hughes estate, uh, I felt confident to suggest to them that I would like to do a book on Hughes. I needed their permission to use the artwork, and I had the archive. Uh, and the first one I did is E.J. Hughes Paints Vancouver Island, uh, because Hughes is a Vancouver Island person and I didn't want that ever to be forgotten because there are people in other places who would like to take ownership of E.J. Hughes, but I felt Vancouver Island was the important one right off the bat. Having done that, uh, the next year, I uh, followed his work uh, as he went up the coast and through his school days in Vancouver and also uh, on his trips uh, uh, across the interior of the province. And the second book is called uh, E.J. Hughes Paints British Columbia. Uh, and it's about the, his paintings of places other than Vancouver Island. But, you know, I began to think that uh, things were getting a little bit serious because those are big, heavy books. And so I thought, let's give the public something really fun. This is a smaller book. It's only half as long. It's called the E.J. Hughes Book of Boats. Because I realized the paintings people like best from Hughes are the paintings with boats in them. And so I gathered all kinds of boats that he'd painted. There were logging boats and fishing boats and ferry boats and the Princess Marguerite and all the rest and uh, made a book of boats, and it turned out to be uh, very popular indeed. But there was one other book which really needed to be dealt with, and that was Hughes as a war artist. Because he was a war artist, he was the longest serving of all Canadian war artists. He was the first one in, the last one out, and the most productive of them all. But all of his war work was retained by the Canadian Army and is at the Canadian War Museum. And nobody had ever really seen it. Uh, but I had Pat Salmon's notes and Hugh's diaries from his war years and his correspondence. And so I went to work and put it together. This one could only have been done though with the participation of the Canadian War Museum 
who supported me in every way they could by providing the photographs and uh, editing and reviewing uh, what I was writing. And uh, this was the most uh, complicated and difficult of all of the books, but uh, one which uh, is vitally important to his career. Having got to that point and pretty well have told the story, I wasn't, I didn't want to finish yet though, because Hughes lived very happily throughout his life at Shawnigan Lake and then at Duncan. And even when he lived at Duncan, he still was related to Shawnigan Lake quite a bit through Pat Salmon. And uh, so the final book in the series is E.J. Hughes' Life at the Lake. And this is the story of the, it's a personal story. The other ones are more about his career as an artist, but this one, uh, has uh, tells uh, uh, about his life with his wife Fern and uh, how he uh, met up with uh, Dr. Stern in Montreal which made his career possible and also uh, his relationship with Pat Salmon for the last uh, 30 some years of his life. So this is the new book and perhaps the final one of the series. Well, excellent. On that note, can you tell us a bit about how E.J. Hughes came to live at Shawnigan Lake and sort of the choice behind that? And it, it comes out in the book, but it's a good story. <laughs> well, it's, it's hard to believe, but Hughes and his wife Fern were living in Victoria from 1946 when he was demobilized from his, from his army uh, duties. They, they, they came to Victoria where his parents lived, but he just found Victoria so busy, so <laughs> noisy, so nerve-wracking. It was just, he couldn't, he lived in, in uh, James Bay at first, and his parents suggested he should buy a big old house and they could rent out rooms uh, like Emily Carr did, and then he could have a studio and do his painting. But uh, he wasn't the landlord type, and that didn't work out at all. So then he bought a succession of little houses in Fernwood, uh, where he could live quietly with his wife, Fern. But their neighbors would have a barking dog or something. It was just dry. He didn't find the peace and quiet that he wanted in 1948 in Fernwood. <laughs> So they looked around to try to find out somewhere where they could live that was that was was quieter, and they considered Saanich. But then one day he saw a newspaper advertisement uh, for a property on, at Shawnigan Lake, and the real estate agent took them up there. He, they had no car, they had no telephone, they had nothing. But the realtor took them up there, and uh, Hughes uh, saw this big ramshackle old house by the lake. Uh, he, he got out to have a look around. By that time, his wife Fern was uh, suffering from muscular dystrophy and she didn't want to walk up the hill to the house. So he went and looked at it himself. And you know, a more practical person would have realized that the, the only running water in the house was a faucet out on the back porch, you know, mm -hmm. and there, there was no central heating. Uh, uh, the place was going to need an awful lot of landscape maintenance and, and upkeep, but I'm sure that Hughes just stood there and the quiet of the wind in the trees and the waves lapping against the shore completely won him over. <laughs> and they took it and bought it and moved in and lived happily ever after. <laughs> Maybe not practical, but very romantic. I love the story. <laughs> um, E.J. Hughes's work was sold by and represented by really Montreal's best dealer of the day, uh, Dr. Max Stern, owner of the Dominion Gallery. And in reading through your book, I was really struck by the story outlining how E.J. Hughes came to be represented by Max Stern. And I wonder, could you tell us how that happened and a little bit about their successful relationship as an artist and dealer? Well, I can, I'll try, I'll, try to, I'll try to make it succinct. You're quite right in saying Max Stern was, Max Stern was the 
number one art dealer in Canada. And he was a European man, he was from Germany. And uh, his family had owned art galleries before. And he represented, I mean, Henry Moore and Marc Chagall. And it was, it was just incredible what he did in Montreal. But Lauren Harris, famous of the group of seven, introduced him to Emily Carr. And Stern came to Victoria in 1944 and met Emily Carr and said, I like your paintings. I'd like to have a show in Montreal. Well, she didn't believe him. <laughs> She'd been burned too often before, yeah. but he did. He took 56 of her paintings to Montreal and he had a show during wartime, 1944, and he sold 46 of them. She was astounded. <laughs> Uh, they were going to have another show, but unfortunately Emily died at that time. But uh, Lauren Harris, who was Emily Carr's executor, arranged for her paintings in her estate to be sold through the Dominion Gallery. And that worked out really well for Max Stern. So a few years later, 1951, Stern came out west again, and he was having lunch with Lauren Harris at the faculty club at UBC. And in my envisioning of it, Stern leans across the table and says, Harris, that deal with Emily Carr really worked out well. Yeah. <laughs> Have you got any others? <laughs> <laughs> and Lauren Harris looked across the room and there hanging on the wall was E.J. Hughes' painting on loan to the University of British Columbia, the painting of fish boats at Rivers Inlet. Mm -hmm. And he said, Ed Hughes, he's your man. Stern and Harris looked around the university and found two more of Hughes' paintings. And by then he was convinced. And Stern came to Victoria immediately and he tried to find Hughes. But Hughes had left with no forwarding address. But Stern went to the newspaper, the Times, the Victoria Times, and uh, found a bright young reporter there who got on the case. And the two of them went looking for Hughes. It took them three days. Eventually, the RCMP in Shawnigan Lake said, oh, yes, it's down there, the big brown house. So they went over to Hugh's place. I can imagine them coming up to the front door. <laughs> no telephone. <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Hughes. I'm Max Stern from Montreal, and I, I'd like to see some of your paintings. So Stern went in and looked around the house. And before very long, he said, I like what you do. I'd like to buy it all. Oh. Right. And they sat down at the kitchen table and wrote out a contract. And Stern bought everything Hughes had. Uh, all of the million dollar paintings, everything else. He bought it all for $500. Oh. The deal of the century. Oh, you know, on that first meeting with Hughes, he told me this story and he said, you know, about three weeks after that, I was saying to my wife, Fern, wasn't that wonderful? That guy from Montreal came and bought all those paintings. And she said, Ed, you don't understand. He wants to buy everything. Like just send it to him. And Stern sent a check by return mail. He bought everything. It wasn't on consignment. Every single thing that Hughes made, he sent to Montreal and was paid immediately. And this went on from 1951 until Stern's death in 1988. And it continued until the Dominion Gallery closed in the year 2000. That's every incredible. single thing that Hughes made and everything else he'd done earlier, which he could find, he sent it all to the Dominion Gallery. And although the prices were embarrassingly low in the beginning, the prices rose and rose and rose to where in the end he was getting checks for $25,000 a painting. Wow. It's uh, quite an unusual story with the Canadian art history. <laughs> I think it's unique. <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah. Um, so Hughes lived quite a quiet life at Shawnigan Lake and then at Duncan. Um, and I think you've touched on this, but can you talk a bit about how he became so famous and how he sort of 
carved out the space and the time to maintain a quiet life at Shawnigan and how that really informed his work. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, in fact, of course, it's, it all has to do with this relationship with Dr. Stern. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Uh, because Stern went right to bat for Hughes in, in the beginning. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, after Stern went back to Montreal and took the paintings with him, uh, or they were shipped to him immediately, he began selling the paintings. He began selling them to the National Gallery, the uh, Art Gallery uh, the, in Montreal, the Department of Foreign Affairs. He, he was just selling the paintings one right after the other to the m most prestigious collections in the country. Uh, Hughes uh, was naturally pleased, but he didn't have to do anything except cash the check. Uh, the, in fact, their correspondence between Stern and Hughes was the only correspondence Hughes really had in his life. And fortunately, I have all of the correspondence in both directions. You can read what they said to each other. And Hughes really appreciated Stern's uh, understanding of the art market and uh, his willingness to take care of all the business for Hughes. Uh, commissions began to come up from the Imperial Oil Company or, or different uh, uh, industrial concerns that wanted to hire Hughes. Hughes didn't know how to talk to those people. He didn't want to talk to those people. I mean, they wanted to commission a, the interior of a railway car, the dining car, the CPR. <laughs> Hughes, it was just too much for him. Stern said, don't worry, leave it to me. I'll take care of it all. Here's what you do. <laughs> I'll send you the canvas, you paint the picture and send it back and you'll, your money will arrive very shortly. Um, he took care of everything for him. In fact, in their whole time <clears throat> together, all those years, they only met three times. And uh, Hughes never went to the opening of any exhibition he ever had with the possible exception of one in the old Kirk Gallery in Shawnigan Lake. But the <laughs> National Gallery, Montreal Museum, Breatherbrook Gallery, he never went. He was allowed to stay home and just keep on doing his work. Because all that social stuff made him really nervous. And even the thought that he would have, you know, that somebody was coming to interview him next week would set him off. He'd lose a whole week's production for worrying about what he might say or have to say. Right, right. That makes sense. Um, on that note, so Hughes has a reputation for being a sort of a recluse. And I wonder if you could tell us if you, if you think that's really true and what led to his retired lifestyle and how it really manifested into his professional life. Hmm. Uh, this is a, a, a very good question and one which um, maybe I should take up at length uh, r writing about it. I, in my books, I've avoided in large measure writing about Hughes's personal life. This new book takes you closer to it than, than has d been done before. But I didn't do that uh, just out of respect for his, his desire for privacy. He, uh, you know, uh, and if, if he was asked, uh, you know, could you come and receive an honorary doctorate? He'd say, no, no, I can't do that. I can't, I can't take away the time from my painting because it would ruin his concentration. And that is undoubtedly true. When you look closely at his paintings, you realize they are the product of a profound ability to concentrate. But in my research, I think there's more to it. Uh, it was his nature to be a solitary individual. He was not sociable at all. It, it made him nervous. But then his war, wartime experience, which lasted for a long time, I think you'd have to say he came home with PTSD. Uh, not only was the war experience very stressful for him, but also uh, he and his wife, I mean, 
every time he was stationed somewhere in Canada, she'd go over and, and move in and live with him, and she'd get pregnant, and then she'd carry the child all the way to full term, and then they would lose the child at t 10 days or at birth, or finally six months of age. They lost three, if not four children during wartime. This was, and then Hughes would be immediately posted to England or to the Aleutian Islands or something. It was enormously stressful. And uh, when he came away from that war experience, he just, he didn't want to have to deal with the, the, the world at, at large. He, he, he wanted that quietness. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll say one more thing about it too, is that by the time they moved to Shawanigan Lake, Fern's muscular dystrophy was really beginning to tell on her. She, uh, she, her gait wasn't very good when she was walking. She had a, a, a cane, you know, and um, uh, it, it got worse and worse. And I'm sure their housekeeping was uh, uh, just a frightful. Uh, she, she couldn't do it, and he wasn't going to do it, uh, and he never even thought about it, so that they couldn't invite people home and have a social uh, uh, coming and going. So they, they just closed in on themselves. Uh, Dr. Stern was a gift from heaven, because Stern meant you will be paid, your income is secure, all we require is that you stay home and paint. And that's just what he wanted. And so within that world, his wife Fern lived until 1974. And after that, he was so fully set in his ways that he did, he did not want to go out into public, really. Right, right. Would you be able to tell us a little bit about what their day-to-day -day life at Shawnigan Lake would be like? It sounds like very much centered on work and process, but, but I'm sure you can elaborate. Yeah, well, it's, it's always a puzzle to me what, their, what their, uh, their intimate life together there was like, except that they were utterly devoted to each other. She was the first girl he'd ever had a date with in his life. I mean, they just, uh, as soon as they met, he fell for her and she for him, and they were devoted to each other till their dying day. So uh, that was it. Uh, Fern had no education, really, uh, and uh, no uh, ambition or, 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 or desire to do anything but to serve him. So she would be doing the cooking and uh, generally keeping the household together. And uh, Hughes uh, painted all the time. He had a, uh, he had a studio uh, upstairs and uh, he'd, go and, uh, he'd go and work away at it. I read a note the other day, he said, oh, I have such a temper, I get really angry. For instance, he'd be painting away and he'd have to stoke the the fire, the coal fire in his studio. So he'd get it all, he hated setting, but he'd build a fire and he'd get the whole thing working all nice and warm and he'd get to painting and painting and painting. And then suddenly he'd realize that he'd let the fire go out. He'd been so absorbed in his painting. He threw the lid off the stove across the room and broke it. He was explaining how angry he could get. But I mean, you can tell he was so absorbed in his work that that uh, nothing uh, nothing got in his way. If he had to, uh, every week they would take the uh, Sunday off for holiday, and uh, they'd walk over to the galley, uh, little snack bar nearby, and get an ice cream. That was the big treat for them. Uh, later in his life, when he got a car and they could drive, uh, they'd go over to the Dairy Queen and get a banana <laughs> split. Pat Salmon said to me, she said, you know why they went to the Dairy Queen? It was because she, it had curb service and they had electric win he had electric windows in his car so that they could come and serve it to 
uh, fern, and she wouldn't have to get out of the car and hobble uh, away, because eventually uh, she was in a wheelchair and it became uh, blind in one eye and uh, many of the other attributes of muscular dystrophy. So it, it was, they were utterly devoted to each other, but I think you'd have to say he was her primary caregiver for many, many years. Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, um, would you be able to tell us a little bit about Hughes's later life? He lived to be 93, so he really, um, mm -hmm. you would have known him during the later years, so I would have yes, to tell us a bit that's more the about time. that. I'm, uh, I'll try to make myself succinct because I think we're coming to the end of our allotted, uh, allotted time here. Right. But um, the marvelous part about uh, uh, our understanding for the later years is that Pat Salmon f was a, a woman of many parts. She was a mother of seven children and a husband who annoyed her quite a bit. And uh, she was busy. She was busy. Had grandchildren all over the place. A dedicated Roman Catholic. She, but she had the. She took him out to lunch every two or three days or take him for a drive around the countryside, or take the clothes to the cleaners, or get his groceries for him, or whatever it took. And when she came home, she wrote her diary. And she, how she found the time to write about her whole family, as well as Hughes, is a, is a, a marvel. But I was able to uh, gather in uh, her diaries and, and fill it out the parts about Hughes in which she tells you up close and personal. Pat is someone who knew Hughes much better than he knew himself. Right. She was an excellent judge of character and as a writer she was succinct. She just said exactly what she needed to say and moved on. And uh, I, I could tell she was an excellent judge of character because I know a lot of the people she was writing about and you know, <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Uh, so uh, she and Hughes would uh, go out to restaurants all over the Cowichan Valley, all over the waterfront, the kind of places he loved to paint at Crofton or Mill Bay or up the Malahat, uh, all over. And uh, uh, They'd, they'd have lots of laughs and he'd offer infuriating comments. I mean, as a crotchety old bachelor, he, he, he had some pretty crazy opinions, which, uh, I mean, he, he lived in isolation, which Pat did not. Pat was a citizen of the community, but Hughes was all by himself there, doing the painting and occasionally going out for lunch. And uh, it, <laughs> he's an amusing old, amusing old guy. I've uh, uh, avoided uh, offering his uh, the progressively crazier opinions he came up with as he got <laughs> older and older, just because. Uh, you know, you have to have some respect and keep your distance, but uh, uh, he, he was a remarkable fellow. But I can tell you this, right to the very end, Hughes was a sterling character, an upright citizen. He avoided ever saying anything negative about anybody. And of course, he would never do anything like tell a lie or sneak around or do something unto not at all. I mean, every time I ever saw him and almost every picture you see of him, he is dressed in a, a tweed jacket and tie. Right. Uh, he was uh, the uh, upright, straight arrow, uh, simply wonderful person. And it's been a real honor to uh, uh, work through his life and have the opportunity to present his uh, his life and work in these books. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing so much about it. I, I have one final question, which I'm hoping we can, well, you and I have talked a bit about this. Um, one thing I find really fascinating about his work is the level of detail uh, in his preparatory drawings and sort of how they relate to the finished paintings. Um, I feel like you've spent more time with these things than, than anyone else. 
and sort of elaborating on what you've observed and what you can find within those drawings would be wonderful to hear if you could. <laughs> I think we should come back for a special afternoon on that subject. <laughs> this has been a very interesting thing for me because uh, as you know, I'm an artist myself first and foremost. I know what the practice is like. I know what it's like to go and sit in front of a subject of interest and try to draw it what kind of, of, uh, of patience it takes to do that and not to become distracted and wander away or have some other idea, but to actually do it. And that's how Hughes did it. He learned from his Vancouver School of Art days under Charles H. Scott, uh, how to draw what he saw, not copy a photograph, but actually draw what was in front of him. And his practice was to make very careful drawings, he'd spend two and a half or three days doing the drawing of the subject in front of him. You know, sitting on a log by the beach, drawing the, the Crofton pulp mill or something. Uh, and then uh, he would uh, come back for one more day and annotate the drawings. He would write all over them with what <laughs> colors he was going to use and what the tonal values were of those colors. He did it in a shorthand, which is uh, or sort of, it's hard to tell what it or these, you know, why PP underline L could possibly mean, but it, it's a, a shorthand for the colors and tones. He, then he would bring these drawings home. Every three or four years, he'd do a whole sequence of drawings, uh, spend the summer making the sketches, take all the sketches home and just keep them in a pile. And then over the years, days, months, in some cases, many, many years later, would pick up the drawing and set to work and turn it into a full on, full color painting. Uh, and the relationship between every line on the drawing and every color and line on the painting is exactly precise. It never varies. He almost never changed anything in the process of going from A to B or from A to B to C to D because uh, sometimes uh, he would do the drawing on location then he would come home and make a larger a full-size tonal rendering of the painting just in black and white with a pencil and then translate that into a larger oil painting and then perhaps 50 years later translate that oil painting into a watercolor. Uh, it, it, it's, it's an old-fashioned way of doing things and one that I believe uh, you'll never meet an artist who works that way again but that is probably why his paintings have this unusual intensity to them, which means that even uh, something as simple as a picture of the, of the lake shore somehow reaches out and grabs people and really touches them. There is a real density there that people really get attached to. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Robert. Thank you. This is really wonderful. And I hope Hope it's gotten people excited about the book. <laughs> it's been great fun. Thank you. Thank you.